Hello and welcome to our second webinar in our Courageous Conversation series. Welcome to each and every one of you. My name is Eve Rose Bossina. I serve as the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at Agnes Scott College. And I have the privilege of facilitating today's Courageous Conversation in our anti-racism series. I want to remind everyone that closed captioning is available and the instructions for turning it on are up on the screen right now. I'll give you a couple of seconds to turn on the closed caption. This past spring, Agnes Scott College was named one of 24 Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Centers by the American College of Association by the American Association of Colleges and Universities for our systemic work eliminating, eliminating social inequities. As a truth, racial healing and transformation campus, the college partners with local and community groups in projects that advance transformational racial change that promote racial healing activities and erase structural barriers to equity and equal opportunity. These series are called Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation because they help us to acknowledge the wrongdoings and le painful legacies of racism and provide us the tools and education needed to move forward on racial healing and transformation. As a college, we have been working on issues of social issues social and racial justice for a long time. After all, the college is recognized as number two top performer in social mobility. The social mobility indicator measures a school's success at supporting students from low income families to the point of achieving equity with students from families with stronger financial backgrounds. This is in the context of a school that has no racial majority. We are a very diverse group, and I am proud to be part of that community. However, the recent national events have lent a new sense of urgency to our work on equity. So to bring together the college's missions of engaging the social and intellectual challenges of our time and the work we must do as a TRHT campus, we launched our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Courageous Conversations. These discussions engage campus and community leaders across racial lines on race and racism. On June 10th, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted a virtual discussion with an educators panel focused on anti-racist education. Today, you will hear from local leaders on the challenges and the work in Decatur, Georgia, but work that is also very relevant in any city or town in America. So, even though we are doing this virtually, courageous conversation requires that at least we are aware of each other's presence. So I would we would love to know who is listening and watching. In the chat box, we encourage you to check in, tell us where you're joining from, Make sure you reply to everyone and panelists. We will be taking two polls during our hour together. Remember the polls are anonymous, but the chat box is not. So I would like to turn and introduce our panelists now, and then I'll turn to the chat box to see who's listening. First, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Lauren Cochran Johnson. She is originally from Greenville, Alabama, and an 18-year-old resident in DeKalb County. Commissioner Lorraine attended Shaw University, where she received a bachelor's degree in political science and criminal justice, a master's degree in the administration of criminal justice, a master's degree in public administration from Auburn University before attending the John Marshall Law School. Lorraine has a decade, over a decade of experience in print media, mass communications and management. In 2015, 
She joined Real Times Media as the general manager of the Atlanta Daily World newspaper and associate publisher of Who's Who in Black Atlanta and vice president of business development before resigning to pursue public service. Welcome, Commissioner Cochran. Thank you. Our next panelist is Kenneth Cole Coleman, who is the interim president and CEO of the DCAP Chamber of Commerce. He's also currently serving as executive director for infrastructure projects within the city of Atlanta for Georgia Power Company. Mr. Coleman has held numerous senior executive roles for Georgia's Southern Company, Georgia Power Company, as well, including senior vice president of marketing and senior vice president and chief information officer. Prior to joining the Southern Company, he was an economic developer for the Metropolitan Development Board in Birmingham, Alabama. And he has served on numerous civic and profit board of directors in the Southeast. Welcome, Mr. Coleman. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. And then Mayor Patty Garrett, who was elected to the City of Decatur Commission in 2009 and has served as mayor since 2016. She serves as vice chair of the on the board of the National Civic League and as District 3 is vice president of the Georgia Municipal Association. Mayor Garrett is on the Community Resource Committee on the Regional Task Force of the Atlanta Regional Commission, the Welcoming America's One Region mm -hmm. Initiative Steering Committee, and the New American Pathways Advisory Council. She is a graduate of Leadership DCAP and the Atlanta Regional Commission, Regional Leadership Institute. She served as honorary chair of the Islamic Speakers Bureau 2019 Gala. She has taught nutrition and worked as a clinical dietitian at Georgia State University and Emory University Health Services. Glad to have you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with our with the other two panelists. Welcome to each of you. Just be, before we jump in our conversation, I want to give some shout out to people who are joining as well on the on the chat. I see yes. Spencer from from Decatur, um, Aaron Brad Braden from Decatur. Hello, welcome. Renee Madison also from Decatur. How are you? Uh, I stomp hello from Decatur, Franklin, Wilbur Jordan from Washington. Welcome and glad to have you with us. Shelly Rogers, I keep checking in, in and out, but welcome to each one of you. I hope you are creating community in the chat room and along with us here today. So today we are going to do this a little different. We are actually starting with you, our viewers and listeners. We will start right in the beginning with a poll question for you before we launch to the conversation with our panelists. Our first question is, do you think local leaders and elected officials will tackle and resolve racial justice reform in your communities? So we are going to launch the poll and we wanna see your results. In the meantime, we'll come back to this as you answer in, we'll come back and gather them. So I'm going to start with the question series. You know, I read a recent article, um, which we're posting in the chat room as well, in the Atlantic, that kind of talked about racism in terms of first degree, second degree, and third degree, and third degree racism. First degrees are like action that people take overtly against people of color. You know, like the woman who called uh, the police on the black bird watcher in Central Park. Second degrees are more like people who turn their, their backs when they see anti I and mean, when they see racism happen, like adding and, and abating. Third degree are the policies and practices of institution. They can be deadly but on their face, they may look innocent. 
So for example, for the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC had a policy that in order to get tested, you had to get a referral or prescription from your primary care physicians. Well, many people in communities of color do not have primary care physician. And so months, weeks later, we've, you know, we have a higher rate of uh, deaths in, um, in communities of color than others because of that. That was one policy that we would call third degree act of racism. So this article further states that in order to address finally addressing third degree racism, is one way to finally lift the burden of doing anti-racist work from the backs of black people to institutions. So I love that article for that reason. And I refer to it because today I'm talking to three leaders from institutions. So starting with you, Commissioner Cochran, what does systemic racism mean to you? And what does it look like in the context of a county government? Wow, and, and let me first say to you, Eve, as well as to President Zach, of course, my daughter attends Agnes. I love the school, and I'd like to thank you for having a courageous conversation during this time um, and for your commitment to ending social inequalities. Um, when I think of systemic racism, um, it's, it's, it's a very broad thing because what we often deal with when we talk about systemic racism is what I consider to be inherent biases that exist within policy, and they often do not foster inclusion. Um, I think that it's very, um, it's, it's time that we acknowledge that people see the world not as, as they are. And in many instances, we have had policies in place for so long that do not, that are not inclusive. Um, you know, as I hear you and, and we talk about um, creating levels or degrees um, associated with crimes as it relates to racial bias, um, it reminds me of policies like the Omnius Crime Bill and Safe Streets Act that um, I think that was around 1992 where there was a difference in punishment um, for the use of powdered cocaine uh, as opposed to crack cocaine. Um, and the penalties for those who used crack cocaine was far more harsh. But when you looked at the reality, the only difference was the user. So disproportionately, African Americans were incarcerated as a result of their use of, of, of so when we talk about systemic racism, it's very important that we understand we have to honestly view policies very carefully. And in many ways, I feel that uh, America in general has um, contributed to what we're experiencing because for far too long, we have all been complacent in the wake of clear evidence that there is a huge disparity between the treatment even early on when you look at um, middle school children in terms of, of punishment. So I think it's time we are very cognizant and we acknowledge things as they are and not just how we see them. Um, because I define racism as um, all of us being from LA or lower Alabama, I often say, um, racism exists when we have inherent biases that we don't acknowledge and we allow those to affect how we treat other people. So we must first go internal before we look external and honestly just be fair and adjust policies to be more inclusive. So definitely uh, looking at policies, agree. So you, you know, that's exactly what the article was talking about. Before turning to my second question to you, Mr. Coleman, I wanna go back to our polls and share the results with you, our panelists and also with our viewers. So 66% of our viewers says, yes, they have faith in you. You will tackle the ra racism in our community. Mm -hmm. Our leaders will. So that's very, very reassuring. And um, I hope we continue to represent their voice. I did have a comment in the chat that also says, it is not a simple yes or no answer because you're going to need the help of the community to do that. So I appreciate that comment as well. Um, 
So, can, I add, can I add just a little something on that? Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Commissioner Johnson, I thought, answered it beautifully. Um, and, and I love this thought of third degree racism because it, it is the easy one for people to ignore, right? Most people would, who would say that they aren't racist, that means that they aren't necessarily doing something very actively to hurt black or brown or other people. But this is the one is that's easy to ignore. It's things that just happen in the background, right? From housing to transportation to access to capital. Um, those things just tend to happen in the background and people don't, don't necessarily even see it or aware of it. So it's easy to ignore. And I think the challenge is to get more people actively trying to identify where this third degree racism exists and help weed it out. You know, in, yeah. our, in our business community, it's with hiring practices, promotions, the vendors we select, the culture we build in our, in our, in our workplaces. And um, while many companies are active in doing that, there are tons of, of people, uh, white people, who can sit back and although they see the culture as a certain way, not necessarily jump in to address cultural problems because they are not necessarily the ones who are doing it whatever it is, the it that drives the culture wrong. So I just think we need more people active on this third degree racism. Yeah, yeah, right on. It's right in our community and in our institutions. It's the policies, as Commissioner Cochran agreed. It's also in our cities, right? It's in our town. It's the policies we create around housing. And so my second question, and I open this to all three of you, but you can start, Mr. Coleman, is that, as you know, over the past 20 years, the, the demographics of the city of Decatur has changed dramatically and transformed the city from a once that was very diverse to a wider, wealthier, and more inaccessible to people of color. In fact, according to the US Census, in 1980, Decatur's black resident accounted for 41% of the population. Four decades later, it's less than 20%. So I want you all to talk about what all you think are the primary drivers of this cultural change that has happened and what is the impact of that change on race relation? And I can start with you, Mr. Coleman. Well, this, this one for me is a bit difficult. I'll play a newcomer here in that, although I've been in Atlanta 10 years, I really have just worked in Decatur for the last six. I, I love the town. It's a it's great place to eat and work and play. Um, but some of the specifics around the transition, I'm, I'm not going to be as well equipped to answer as some of my esteemed panelists. I know we have seen in other communities particular practices that have influenced uh, changes in demographics in, in, in uh, communities like redlining, right, where um, the banks over time have drawn lines around certain communities or certain communities have been underinvested in. And uh, until property values get to a place where um, many investors will come in afterwards. Don't know if that's the case in Decatur. I've seen it in my hometown of Jersey City. Uh, after 9-11, many of the, uh, the folks who wanted to get out of New York City um, tended to find some of these neighborhoods that were underinvested in. And boy, before you knew it, we had uh, uh, high-rise condos in places where uh, used to be uh, places of blight. And so I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues on some of the specifics in Decatur, but um, we see this all over the community. Well, I certainly have some thoughts and, and let me say to uh, Mayor Garrett that Decatur is one of our most progressive cities. Um, you have done an excellent job and you have an excellent team. And what we see happening in Decatur isn't isolated. Um, when you look beyond Decatur, um, if you look at East Lake, the area known as Belvedere, and even your Candler Road corridor through the Tony Valley area, what you see happening is, um, for lack of better words, it, there is a gentrification taking place. Now, as those communities transform, because if we visit East Lake as a case study, um, of course, the of course transformed that area. Also, its proximity to the city of Atlanta. So what you're finding in many instances is that as property values in the city increase, there is an exodus into areas that are closer. 
Um, when you look at Candler Road, it's 10 minutes proper from the city of Atlanta, part of Atlanta. So many individuals that live and work or like, like work in that area seek closer um, amenities that are more affordable. And as those communities uh, are being transformed, the downside is that in many instances, um, you have an older population that lives in, in those particular areas, homes are sold, um, and once those homes change hands, the individual who once owned that that had been a part of the community could never afford to live in the community again. Now, the upside of what you see happen is that when we talk economic development, and for me, because I have a large part of South and unincorporated DeKalb, um, it lacks tremendously. And developers are concerned with two things, rooftops and income. And as these communities transform, it makes it more attractive for the recruitment of industry. And at the end of the day, that's what everyone desires. But what we have to create is a balance between the transformation and the ability to retain affordable housing um, and ensure that communities have that diversity. So it's a very delicate balance that, that I see that's needed, but Decatur is not the only city. I see many cities around us, particularly those that are close to Metro Atlanta area that are transforming and demographics are changing. Hey, Gary, did you want to add to this question or do you want me to move on? No, I would, I would love to add to that. And uh, thank you for uh, the comments of the two other panelists. And it is a, um, a complicated multifactorial issue that is um, present, not just in Decatur, but it is uh, challenging the entire really metro region, certainly affordability in Atlanta. I'm on the affordable housing task force for ARC, uh, but in Decatur, it has certainly um, impacted us in terms of um, housing affordability, and we've lost not only um, racial diversity, but economic diversity. And um, we have, uh, you know, we are looking, we had an affordable housing task force that worked uh, an entire year to bring forth some recommendations. I'm happy to say that we have an inclusionary zoning ordinance that will be on our agenda in um, at our very next meeting. Um, but an interesting thing happened in the early 2000s in Decatur in the community of Oakhurst. And um, there was a large group of residents who brought forward a recommendation to make the entire neighborhood of Oakhurst a historic district because historic districts in the state of Georgia really have the greatest protection in terms of what um, can you can do in terms of not having teardowns um, in terms of uh, modifying those homes and so forth. And it was an interesting conversation because um, we had folks that were against that due to kind of property rights issues. But the largest group that came out um, against a historic district designation, a local designation, were um, a large number of older um, Afri African American women and who may have lost their spouses, raised their children, had been a part of the Decatur community for decades, and they felt like that if the smaller bungalow homes where they lived, the market value in some way was going to be deflated when they were ready to move out of the community or the, if they um, had to sell their house to move in with a family member or when they pass away that their family member would, would have that property, that they were um, going to be negatively impacted in terms of the value of that property. And so um, one of the things, and that was just before I went on the commission, but um, I think we all learned a lesson about listening and who and how, who's impacted and how is that going to impact the uh, community about whom decisions are being made and to make sure that they um, have a place at the table and are are included in the very beginning. And um, but we saw 
say no to the Oakhurst Historic District signs pop up all over Oakhurst. And so in some ways to uh, Commissioner Cochran Johnson's point, that would have probably um, maintained some of that affordability um, and um, allowed for, you know, uh, but at, at whose cost? And what was that going to be for the, the families that were a part of our community and had given and um, sacrificed to be a part of the city of Decatur? And when they um, no longer were going to be able to live here, how was that going to impact them and their families? So um, it has been affordable housing issues that has been, um, uh, I think there had been white flight prior in Decatur, and then as we've seen trends reverse in the metro area, we certainly saw that happening in, in Decatur as well. So thank you. And, yeah. and I, I would, I'm sorry, I'd like to add two other factors that I think has been key to a lot of the development and growth that we've seen, particularly in Decatur. Um, you can attribute a large part of what you've experienced also to the presence of Marty, the rail line, um, as well as the success of, your, of the public schools. Um, people, as a general rule, want to live in communities that are easily accessible and that have good schools. And as a result of that, it has placed Decatur in a very unique position. Um, so I think we look at the totality of the circumstances, that's something that we cannot eliminate as to a large part of the success of the city of Decatur, um, whether or not we're looking at the changes racially in the composition, um, I think those changes are spurred by the fact that it is a highly desirable area. And you all have done an excellent job in the city of Decatur in terms of your long-term planning and growth strategies. Um, so it's, it's to be commended, um, but you are correct. Um, it has affected the racial composition and it is shifting. So we strike that balance um, because I, I hear less and less, you know, over due to the social unrest that we're experiencing at this time. I think I've heard people speak more um, about inclusion and diversity than I have in decades. Um, <laughs> has not been the most popular conversation. And, you know, coming from Alabama, you know, uh, you know, when we talk about community and we talk about business growth, and I don't want to carry us down a rabbit hole in any sense, but there were, you know, even when we talk about policy, I remember my grandfather saying that when Title VII of the Civil Rights Act was passed, I believe in 64, that everyone bought into the system and expected equality. And he said, no one told us there was a glass ceiling. Um, so I think what we're dealing with is far greater than just simple factors. I think it takes a deep dive to fully understand the inequalities that we see. Yeah. And deep dives we can't do here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but we can certainly raise these issues. You know, but one thing that came to mind when we're talking about the diversity and the attractiveness of Decatur is that I think as, as the community was being gentrified, and that's a word we can use because that is kind of what happened in some sense, is mm -hmm. that people were content of saying, I'm not a racist, you know, you know, I support my community, I just don't pay attention. And I think what we've learned in the newest social movement, it's that it is not enough to be non-racist, one must be an anti-racist. And I think that's where we need to go in the future from this moment on. So my question back to you at Mayor Garrett is that in your role as a city leader, are there any social and racial inequities that you have tackled uh, that you wanna share with us that, um, you know, and how do you, how can we plan that we see the long-term effects are positive and not shown in a racist, um, side consequences, I guess, is a better way of saying that. 
Sure, I'll, I'll give just a couple of uh, quick examples. Uh, back in 2015, um, a resident in the city of Decatur um, felt like he had been um, racially profiled when he was asked to show an ID. As a result of that, um, he met a number of times with our police chief, Chief Mike Booker, and that um, that eventually led to a number of uh, community-wide conversations called our um, Better Together effort. And there were over 800 uh, people that participated. I think some uh, folks from Agnes Scott may have been um, a part of that. So out of that, we had um, the Better Together Community Action Plan for equity, inclusion, and um, community engagement. We had increased police training on um, bias-based training. Um, the city of Decatur's police department developed a strategic plan that um, really challenged. Uh, we were already doing community policing, but really challenged the police department to have conversations in the community and have focus groups to give specific feedback. And um, the person who had um, thought they were racially profiled participated in those focus groups as well as, as was on the initial task force group to um, put together the Better Together conversations. Uh, the police department developed a suspicious behavior versus suspicious person training and brochure that is um, used in education in our in our schools, our community meetings, and um, throughout the um, communities and the neighborhoods. And so I think out of that, there were a lot of conversations that happened, difficult conversations, and the Better Together Community um, Advisory Board was formed. But a um, and I mentioned the Affordable Housing Task Force, but of course we know um, it's not enough. We clearly have to do more. And um, we've certainly seen in the last um, you know, few months, in the last year or so, that um, we need to not only have racial equity and inclusion conversations, but we need to expand that to the racial the anti-racism conversations. And the city of Decatur recently allocated uh, $50,000 for anti-racist training and education. And some of the recommendations that were brought forward from that um, included like joining the Government Alliance on Race, Race and Equity called GARE, G-A-R-E, gives us access to tools and webinars and training. Um, continuing, another recommendation was certainly continuing this partnership with Agnes Scott College on the, the ASC Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Project. Our communications director, Renee uh, Madison, who is uh, participating today, uh, represents the city on that, with that group. And she's also a graduate student at Agnes Scott in the digital and written communication department. Um, we also want to have a community listening session. What does the community need? What does the community want? Um, we're going to have anti-racist training for our boards and commissions because if you serve on an, a, um, an advisory board or a state commission, we want to make sure that that, um, that anti-racism and equity lens is a part of the training. You need to not just know about, you know, what somebody on the zoning board is going to, you know, be tasked with doing, but they need to understand that um, uh, being equitable and having an anti-racist background in education and understanding is a part of that responsibility as well. So um, we look forward to beginning to implement um, using our Better Together board. So I think that has, to me, has been one of the key issues that have, has come up um, in, in recent months in the midst of our, our pandemic and certainly our uh, need to recognize that um, as Commissioner Cochran Johnson said, we are a progressive community, but we 
also recognize that um, we have to do and we must do more. So we can take down monuments with the, with the uh, county commission, but if that's all we do, then okay. that is certainly not enough. Thanks. That is, that is, as you were talking, I was thinking that is why I love the city. That was just amazing work you were going. Thank you for, for that. Um, I want to also ask our audience to, if they have advice for our panelists in terms of what are the priorities that they should be thinking about in terms of addressing racism and discrimination, please put them in the chat room. We will uh, make sure we collect them and send them back and our, our panelists will have them because it does take a whole community and a village to, to, to tackle this big issue. Um, my I, next question, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I know, I know. I just wanted to add, I want to commend, first of all, Mayor Garrett uh, and Commissioner Cochran for um, both the, the work, the broader work that they're doing, much of which um, Mayor Garrett mentioned, um, and also taking down the visible signs of the monuments and all. I think just for our audience, if I had an encouragement, the, the, the anti-racism on first degree and sometimes second degree, as we talked about earlier, are easy. And I would encourage our listeners and viewers to really focus on the third degree of racism. The, the encouragement of elected officials, business leaders, um, and others on some of the more systematic, subtle, behind the scenes policies on uh, around education and transportation and such. That, that's where I think we can really make a difference. Thank you. So my next question is kind of continues the conversation. It's, it's in the same kind of um, thought. You know, when we participate in a democratic institution or workplace, we take on the incredible responsibility of shaping that institution, both as participant and as leaders. So we also therefore have incredible power to resist the harmful cultures and policies that reinforce racism. Um, how can we, you in your role, make sure that we do not go back to the thing, to the way things were before the before these recent movements. And I say that, and I'm thinking uh, of something that I read also, is that Martin Luther King and Dr. Martin Luther King in 1963 warned that America was a 10 day nation that moves on very easily from one each crisis to the next. So how can we make sure these changes, this, this progress we are making keep us moving forward. Any advice and thoughts on that? All three of you are welcome to jump in. I can start with you with Mr. Coleman, since your mic is I'll, I'll, be glad to. I'll, I'll, I'll start and um, my comments will come more from a business perspective. Um, I, I think from uh, whether it's an individual smaller business or a larger corporation, I think clearly making sure that the leadership of your organization is uh, both uh, strong and understands these institutional biases. So there's training um, and determinations of who you hire and, and that they're reflective of the community. And I think um, business leaders need to make sure that the, their preferences and their strong desire to eliminate racism and bias, inherent biases, wherever they are, is known communicated often and communicated frequently. Um, and, and I think there's an accountability portion that, um, that I think our business community has to our community at large to communicate these things and hold themselves accountable for progress. Um, and, and then I think for long-term change, we've got to add some financial resources to whatever changes, causes, um, recruitment tactics to help make sure that the other things, right, who you, who's on your leadership, the communication, the actual tactics to help eliminate some of the subtle biases all happen. And so you got to put your money where your mouth is. And that is uh, where um, I'm proud to say Southern Company has spent a good bit of time on, my former employer. And it is where we'll encourage many of our current investors in the chamber to, to also live. And I would just add that, you know, when we talk about going back to where we were, I think during the 70s, what you dealt with was a more overt um, 
expression of racism because it was during that time, of course, uh, again, that we had tremendous social unrest. So you saw the images of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You saw the images of the bus boycotts and the sit-ins. Um, today, I would say that we have had gains with omissions. Uh, when I say gains with omissions to say we don't want to go back, um, I believe we have progressed forward, but we've still somehow failed to see ourselves, in my opinion, totally as a human race. Um, because when you look at the data, when you look at the sheer facts, um, the earning disparities that we see um, amongst um, your black and brown and, and white individuals, Caucasian, whatever the popular words are that people choose to describe themselves by. Um, when you look at the incarceration disparities, um, what we fail to do in America, in my opinion, is acknowledge what has been overtly present. And I believe that um, with the death of Mr. Floyd in particular, um, there has been a long time and a long history of failure to punish um, um, individuals who have engaged in, I guess what we would define as that first degree crime that we talk about when we talk about classification. Um, and it's just come to a point where you can no longer say you didn't see what you saw. Um, because for anyone that watched that video in particular, you saw eight minutes of a man losing his life um, that was in literally a position of compromise at the hands of individuals who had complete control, who were sworn to protect and serve. So what I say when I say let's not go back, I say sometimes you have to go back to move forward. Um, you know, I this year brought on a legislative consultant to assist me with legislation. And ironically, my office had started to review police policies um, after a conversation with him uh, about a month police policies and defunding of police stations um, occurred as a result of what we experienced. Um, and there is a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. So I would say that, you know, it's not about going back, but it's about correcting wrongs so that we can progressively move forward. And I think that begins with each and every one of us. It's not just about elected officials. You know, we can pass legislation that uh, regulates traffic, alcohol, and drugs. But what we have in America is a breakdown of the human spirit, and we cannot mandate um, morality. So I think it's time that we all take a critical look at ourselves and what it is we're doing um, to ensure that we live in a society that is respectful of all people, regardless of the color of their skin um, or their personal um, differences, as well as socioeconomics. Mayor Garrett, as you um, chime in on that last question, I'm going to add another piece to it for you uh, to help us with time. Okay. Is um, also let us how are you as a private citizen, how are you educating yourself on issues of racial justice? What are you reading that helping you these days? I'd love to hear. Right, um, and I, let me just quickly, uh, there have been some chat questions to me and I, I'll answer a couple of them and then if you want to send the rest to me, I'll be glad to answer them um, later. But somebody asked about Decatur 101, whether we were going to include the anti-racism training in our Decatur 101 classes, and yes, we are. And someone asked about the school resource officers at the um, high school and the middle school. And um, I mean, one of the things that we are looking at as a part of you know, the listening from the community is, um, uh, you know, having some facilitated um, conversations with the police department that are facilitated by our Better Together um, uh, advisory board. And I will say we, the city commission had a, um, a work session before our last meeting that included um, a number of people from our chief and uh, 
deputy chief of the police department, as well as the um, officer in, in charge of training, as well as our school high school resource officer. Um, his background is he is, um, he is a youth pastor who decided to become a, um, a police officer. And so um, that's one of the things that I think that we, that our police department has tried to do is to have people um, with uh, appropriate skills and backgrounds working. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm happy to have that conversation later. And I love that you ask about what we were reading and what we were, I have a, a book club this evening that is uh, talking about the book, White Fragility and, um, I am, um, we, you can't find it anywhere now. And so, uh, which is a good thing. Um, people are reading it. And mm -hmm. uh, right now I am reading Stacey Abrams' new book, Our Time Is Now, about nice. voter suppression. And um, she's a, you know, such a smart, talented, remarkable person and gifted author. And I um, just felt like it would be, that would, be a really good, I just happened to read a review of the book uh, a few weeks ago and thought what a what a um, amazing person to read a book um, that she, another book that she has written and that um, um, our time is now. I think one of the things that has stayed with me from some of the webinars and um, meetings that I've attended. The, the CEO of the American Psychological Association um, mentioned through, I was on a, a call with the National League of Cities through their racial equity and leadership training. And he said, is this going to be a tipping point or is this going to be like Groundhog Day where we keep doing the same things over and over and over again and um, expecting somehow to get different results? And so, I, you know, it's my hope that we are at a tipping point and that we don't come back in another year and it's been Groundhog Day. So, um, but I think reading, paying attention, and, and listening are things that are important, um, especially for me to do right now. Thank you. I, yeah, I love that our panelists are answering the questions in the chat room. That's, that's just wonderful. I appreciate that. I want to, since we're doing that, I want to take another question in the chat room. This might be for Commissioner Cochran, I'm not sure. It says, what is the status of the recommendations provided by the City of Decatur Affordable Housing Task Force. So any of anybody knows? Well, it, those probably for the City of uh, Decatur. Okay. They were, <laughs> right. I'm sure they are Garrett's office. So I will defer that question directly to you, uh, Mayor Garrett. So those recommendations can be found on our, our website. And we are one of the the first recommendations was to establish the uh, to establish inclusionary zoning, and so that is something that we are moving forward on. Other things that we are looking at, in particular, is how do we uh, maintain some of our naturally occurring affordable housing um, because some of our older um, housing stock, especially our our um, apartments and a few of the condominium buildings, if we can keep those and we're looking at all kinds of different solutions, are there ways to offer some um, tax benefits or incentives, particularly when some of the federal tax um, benefits go away, um, can we keep those properties from being sold and redeveloped because um, th that is really one way that it helps. It is, um, it is less expensive to maintain what we have than given the price of land in Decatur to try to find additional places. But we also have housing as one of the uh, recommendations for the development that will um, happen at Legacy Park. Um, there's much of that will, uh, those structures will be um, used for um, park space and some um, renovated for an artist community, but they're both the north and south portions are being looked at for, um, for housing that we hope will come um, 
uh, pandemic has sort of uh, set everything behind a little bit on when some of those may move forward, but the specific recommendations of that task force are found on the um, city's website and we um, we're using those as a basis to how we move forward. It looks like I'm going to have to have each one of you individually for a courageous conversation because there's so much to talk about and time is flying by. So I'm going to ask you each to think about um, maybe some parting words, some closing remarks, starting with your commissioner, but I want to I wonder if I could ask you if you could share something personal about maybe the first or early memories of racial discrimination. Um, I think it's important as a black leader in our county for the listeners to hear that perspective, if you, if you don't mind. Wow. Um, I can say growing up in LA, lower Alabama, um, you know, my, my grandfather and many members of my family were very active um, in two things. They were active in the civil rights movement and a long line of Southern Baptist ministers. And I can truly say, and I'm very proud to say, that as a child, um, I don't feel that I experienced racism. Um, it's not until I was older and had the ability to look back that I understood that there were a different set of schools that were called private schools that totally segregated us by race. However, the school that I attended was very racially diverse. Back then, you know, it's just black and white people. And we all lived together, we played together. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I actually have brought to mind a memory that I shared with um, my staff last week because I've never allowed other people to define me. So it really doesn't matter what you call me. Um, it doesn't bother me because I'm comfortable with who I am. It may make, may make me think. Mm -hmm. First example of, of overt racism that I experienced was actually at Auburn University after graduating and being retained there as their director of minority recruitment. Um, for a period to help increase those numbers. And um, I don't want to rehash it because I think somewhere in my mind, I sort of set that aside. Good for you. It's just what I saw as an unfortunate experience. And what I've come to believe about people that may be racist or people that have racist ideas is that they are products of their environment. So I was not seen as an individual at that time with a BS and two masters. Um, I was seen only as an individual who was African-American and because of that, I was treated differently. Mm. So I do believe in the inherent goodness of people. And I do believe that communication and seeking to first understand and then to be understood by exposing ourselves to different cultures is the key and I think conversations like this are absolutely imperative because as an elected official, one thing I found is that there's about four issues that unify all people, infrastructure, public safety, um, workforce, economic development. Those are the things that people care about. So if we look at the common denominators and stop looking at, at, at divisive factors, I have great hope that this uh, time, this period has sparked a conversation that will carry us into a progressive future. Thank you. Mr. Coleman, in terms of parting words, um, and also in that thinking about what has been empowering and hopeful moment for you during this past few weeks? Okay, I'm gonna give you three quick stories to wrap it all up for me. One okay. is a story about a guy named Bobby Thrunk. Um, I went to one of those private schools in, in New Jersey that was associated with the church. 
My school was wonderfully diverse. It had about a third, a third, a third of black, white, and other, mostly Spanish. And uh, Bobby was a good friend of mine. Bobby's a white guy, his mom's a nun and, and converted, and dad's a fireman. And so I'm staying at Bobby's house at, at the shore in New Jersey. And we go out and walk on the board, boardwalk. Someone apparently says something that I don't hear. Bobby turns around and punches him right in the face. I don't condone fighting, um, but, but Bob is an example of the opportunity for us to get to know each other, love each other, and protect mm -hmm. each other. Um, and I think my hope is there's more and more stories of that. Second thing, um, as Commissioner Johnson said, none of us are ever immune. Um, three months ago, uh, I'm riding in Chambly in um, what I'll call a DWBNC, so driving while black in a nice car. Um, I pass a Shambly policeman. He turns around and follows me for a mile, turns his lights on, stops me in, right in front of picking up my uh, son at, at baseball practice. When I asked him why he stopped me, he told me my sticker in the rear he didn't recognize. Well, he didn't see my sticker in the rear from the front of my car when he passed me, right? And so we have to always be present. Um, and and it's, it's one of those things that if you are a black man, you have to, black person, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, last thing I'll leave you with is I am encouraged. I have two boys who are 16 and 13. Um, part of the toughest part of what's happened here in the past month or so after George Floyd was me sitting them down and us watching the early protests and riots and fires in Atlanta. The uplifting part of that was we went and as a family and went to protest and we took pictures before we went out and protested with our sons and their friends and they were wonderfully diverse, white, black, Asian, uh, Hispanic, and it was like a melting pot of America out protesting injustices, which is where I hope we all get to. Thank you. And Mayor Garrett, I'm going to come back to you, leave you a lasting word, a parting word, the last word, because we are in Decatur and we are honoring the city. But I yes. do want to remind our audience that, as, as always, it's not enough to have the conversation. We must commit ourselves to be anti-racist, to be an anti-racist. And so I encourage you to visit our website for the list of action that um, you, you, you can take. And I think we're going to put it up as well for you. Just commit to doing something. Just commit to doing more than listening and being part of the conversation. These conversations are just a little tip of the iceberg to just get us started. But they are by no means where we need to end. And so we are coming up to the four o'clock hour. I want to thank each one of you. And as I said, Mayor Garrett, I'd ask you to leave us with your last thoughts. And thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really been my honor to participate in this. And let me again say thank you so much to Agnes Scott College. It is um, a partnership that I treasure and value. I very much enjoyed getting to know um, President Zach and um, just know that the, the leadership and the faculty and staff and students are so committed to um, being such good neighbors in Decatur, but also leading the way and helping us um, have these courageous conversations and deal with uh, difficult issues. It is encouraging to hear my co-panelists um, paint a picture of um, moving forward and taking, taking action as a female who, um, as a white female who grew up in Texas and had um, mostly segregated schools until high school, um, I look back to um, my, you know, my, some of my first um, black friends were friends and colleagues at my first job. And um, I think those personal relationships um, help build trust. And I think developing personal relationships and starting with um, difficult conversations and talking about things that um, as, um, you know, 
uh, not being a, a person of color, it is much, um, I sit back and think, you know, I have three grown sons. When they were teenagers, I thought about them going out and doing things that teenage boys might do that I would be, con you know, concerned about, not making good decisions. But I did not have to worry about some of the things that my uh, friends who are persons of color talk about with their sons and the uh, the, the incident that um, Kenneth described. And so those are the kinds of things that we have to recognize and talk about and change. So um, thank you again. It's been a pleasure and honor to be a part of this conversation. Thank you to all of you.